Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> morning. It's so great to be back for my second week here. Uh, there are a couple of announcements I would like to share before we continue with worship. Uh, first, uh, you're going to hear from Carrie in a little bit about our love fest and your opportunity to come and get valentines and drop off uh, donations for the food pantry and for the warming station. So I would love to see you drive by and just have one more chance to see you. I haven't seen all of you nearly enough yet, so come and see me if you feel safe driving. Next week is the beginning of Lent, and we're going to be doing a sermon series and a worship series based on the theme of God's faithful to, faithfulness to us again and again. No matter what we are going through, no matter what is happening, we can trust that God is going to be faithful and is going to reach us again and again. And during the season of Lent, we are all going to be raising money together for RIP Medical Debt, which is an excellent organization that buys medical debt from collection companies. And if you don't know how that process works, whenever someone does not pay a debt, it is often sold to a collection company for less than it's worth, which is again sold over and over. So the debt costs whoever owns it far less than the amount. So people buy debt in order to make a profit. 
but RIP Medical Debt buys that and forgives it. And because it's sold so often, for every $100 you give, they can purchase and forgive $10,000 of medical debt. So during this season of Lent, let our fast be to loose the bonds of injustice and to help people who are in great need be relieved. <coughs> With that, I will turn it over to our liturgist. Please join me in a call to celebration. Gathering in this sacred place, we anticipate new wonders each week. Wherever two or three are gathered to worship, God's Holy Spirit is present. Open our eyes to witness the fantastic love and wondrous joy waiting to be revealed even this day, even this place. We will want to linger and camp in this sanctuary, but when we leave today, may our hearts be open to all the wonders of God's beautiful world. And now our gathering prayer. O Holy One, on mountaintops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our heart's desire is to bask in the amazing glory of the divine presence. With each encounter, we are changed and transformed. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of divine glory. May we walk among our siblings and friends as a blessing, bearing light into dark places, hope, to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. Our world is hurting, and we need the followers of Jesus to follow more closely. Maybe then we will hear your voice speaking to us and saying, listen to my child, the beloved. Amen. for you, just like always. What do these mean? I'm guessing you've seen these before. They're hearts. 
people are wearing them today. Carol Titcomb has a has a hearts all over her mask today. So why do we share this kind of greeting, these hearts? And the answer is it's love, right? This is the symbol for love and it's all different kinds of love. And we talk about them especially today on Valentine's Day. So today is a day to tell those who are important to us that we love them. So who's important to us? Um, I said before that I gave my kids, my, my husband and I gave my kids little little something for Valentine's Day this morning. Um, my kids' grandparents showed up yesterday with some treats and surprises. So there's someone else who's important to us as our family. Anybody get Valentine's from their friends at school today? Or maybe if you're in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, do you guys do something for, for Valentine's Day? Who else? We've seen a lot of these hearts all around the community this year, haven't we? Expressing our love and appreciation for all of our first responders and nurses and frontline workers as they've helped take care of us this past year with the pandemic. So someone, there's someone else who loves us no matter what. And who is that? So that's God. And Jesus actually commands us in when he was teaching to share that love with our communities, with everyone. And it's all the time we're supposed to, to share that love, not just special days like Valentine's Day. And we're supposed to share that love, but not just by saying that we love somebody, but with our actions. And that's what today's love fest is about, is it's about this church community saying, we love you to each other, hence the Valentines that we have for all of you that are part of our youth group so lovingly packed last weekend. It's also a chance for us to love on our community. We have a gathering going for the food bank and they are so appreciative. It's been such a hard year for them. And we're also collecting warming supplies, warming items for um, the community dining room for them to hand out to um, their guests as well. We're going to be here today from 11 to 1. Um, and we also have Lenten supplies for everybody. So we have um, devotionals and other things that we, that'll be available for anybody who would like them. And if for some reason you can't get over here today, all you have to do is drop it off at the church during regular hours this a week upcoming, or give us a call, let us know, and we'll be happy to come by and pick it up from you and get it to where it needs to be. We'll do, we'll do our ding dong dash, as I like to call it, where we, we will leave you a little something and we'll grab what you've left for us on your front porch and say hi from a masked distance. It's so important for us as part of this community to love on them. So when we have something to give, we can give and, um, and help our community. I can't wait to see you guys this afternoon. I'm so much looking forward to seeing your faces. So this week, I want you to think about other ways that you can share and show God's love with all of those around you. Please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you so much for the love that you show us day in, day in and day out. And we know that even though we can't see you, you're with us. And now we pray together using the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our prayer of brokenness and confession. Forgive us, God, when we linger too long by the waters, and on the mountaintops, enthralled with the glory that flows from you. When we fail to listen to your voice, leading and guiding us, 
shake us from our contentment and send us forward endowed with your power. Amen. The God of Elijah, the God of Moses, and the God of Jesus desires mercy more than sacrifice and a contrite heart rather than burnt offerings. So love God and do the right thing and forgiveness shall be your friend and mercy shall be your companion. Amen. Our morning prayer. Good morning and happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day to everyone. Today we meet together amidst great angst in our country. We are all living through the COVID-19 pandemic, loss of jobs, the need to work from home, the need to remotely educate our youth, the stresses of housing and food insecurity, the mental stresses and fears of the unknown weighing heavily on each of us. We all know someone or know someone who knows someone who has been directly affected by this virus. We pray for them and their families, and we pray for our leaders who are working to protect us. Let us pray that they may make the right decisions that protect the most vulnerable as a priority, and ultimately, all of us. It is indeed a difficult time. Yet, we still find the time to come together each Sunday to greet each other, to smile, to laugh, to feel better together. We know deep down that this too shall pass. We work to keep our faith and hope strong. We work during the week to assure our FCCB community remains just that, to foster the faith and hope we place in Jesus and each other. We work on assuring our Sunday worship is fulfilling. We work on our ongoing projects through our leadership teams. We thank our administrative team for keeping the lights on, the bills pay, and the continuity they provide to us all. We, sure, we work to assure our youth feel a sense of community and support that we are all in this together. Later this morning, we can demonstrate our togetherness through our participation in our FCCB Love Fest. Both our FCCB community and the greater Brantford community will be better for your engagement. Dear Jesus, Please give our Joe and Julia your grace and comfort as they begin a new phase of their journey in life. Moving to a new community always, bring, always brings some trepidation. Your work through us certainly provides a level of comfort that they made the right decision. Give them the strength and knowledge to know we have all the answers to their questions. Well, most anyway. Please pray for all our members and friends who are suffering in these days. A migraine, a difficult diagnosis, a COVID-19 positive test, the loss of a loved one or friend. Pray for those who have difficult decisions to make, personal, social, or work-related. Let them know we are thinking of them and we offer them our support. Please join me in a moment of silent personal prayer. Amen. Twenty-five thousand six hundred minutes. Five hundred twenty-five thousand months. So. Deep. 
time of offering. Peter offered to build a tabernacle on the mountain with Jesus. But God does not dwell in houses made with human hands. Let us offer ourselves in service to those God loves. Let us offer our sacrifices to build community, bring peace, and be a double blessing to those in need throughout the world. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. these gifts we proclaim not ourselves but Jesus and commit ourselves to follow a way that leads to love and life. May our gifts be witnesses to our love for one another and to the God who loves us all. Amen. The scripture lessons today are from 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 through 12 and the gospel of Mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 9. Listen to the word of God according to 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know, keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah, ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Listen to the word of God according to Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, 
and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of the transfiguration is his three very closest friends would have started to suspect who he was by this point in the story of Mark. After all, one of them, Peter, had even figured out that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, just a few weeks before this. But then they get invited to the most holy encounter that any of them could imagine, and they missed the point so badly that God has to reach down and call them out for their nonsense. How far out of line do you have to be for the voice of God to call down from heaven and tell you to shut up? That's what's happening here. The story comes at the end of the season of Epiphany which is the time in the church year that we mark with stories from our spiritual family tree of the times and the places that our ancestors were given the grace of the awareness of the palpability of God's love, justin, justice, and compassion. And it's not a coincidence that we save this story for last. This story about the radical presence and power and glory and unimaginable grace of God that the disciples encountered on the mountain. In the church year, this is the final story that we share together before we embark on our Lenten journey through the darkness of Lent, before we mark our foreheads with ash and remember that we are just dust and to the dust we shall return at the time of our death. This story is the biggest epiphany during the season of epiphany, the most powerful moment when God's grace, love, compassion are shown to our ancestors and to us. This is the moment when the veil of the world is lifted and we see reality as God sees it. A transfiguration is at its heart, a transformation of something into something else that is more beautiful and more elevated and profound than we could have imagined. And Jesus's three closest friends, Peter, James, and John got to experience and to witness the love that lives at the heart of all things shining out in the form of a person. They witnessed the moment where their teacher and friend Jesus was so in alignment with the love of the one who created all things that he was transformed in front of their eyes into something greater than they ever imagined. But exactly what they should have known he was all along if they'd been paying attention. And they heard again the words that were spoken at the, uh, the River Jordan when Jesus was baptized by John. This is the beloved. Jesus is the beloved of God, and the good news of scripture is that in Christ we share in that belovedness. So the story of transfiguration at its heart is a story about identity. And I love the way my favorite preacher, Nadia Bowles Weber, put this. She says that identity is always God's first move. Before we do anything wrong, before we do anything right, God has named us and claimed us as God's own, as God's beloved. But almost immediately, other things try to tell us who we are and to whom we belong. Capitalism, industries that prey on insecurities about our body images, our parents, kids at school, all of them have a go at telling us who we are and to whom we belong, but only God gets to do that. Everything else is just a lie. And Nadia summarized the gospel in my favorite way. You are who God says you are. And everything else is a lie. 
everything else that tells us we are less than, fallen from, short of, not enough, too much, all lies. Everything that fails to recognize the utter belovedness of every single person is a lie. Everything that wants to take the experience of God's transforming love and contain it in dogma, creed, doctrine, rubric, order, canon, construct, whatever, all lies or even containing God's love in a booth or a tent. That's also a lie, and Peter bought into that lie. He's my favorite disciple. He's faithful, clueless, the chronic big mouth. He interrupts the dance of light and love to suggest building some booths, because that's what one did back then when you had an encounter with God. And that's what we do. You set up shop and you try to contain it. And that's the part of the story where my Southern grandmother would have sighed and shook her head and said, well, bless his heart. He's trying to hold on to something, to the way things were, to what was safe and what was known, to a religion that is domestic and respectable, even though his religion would have been none of those things if he took the words of Moses and Elijah and all the other prophets seriously. And if we were too hard on Peter, we should acknowledge that we tend to do the same thing, don't we? How often does the church universal celebrate Jesus in a way that is internal and restricted as we attempt to hold on to the Christ we worship for ourselves instead of taking Christ to the world? Our safe Christ who meets our needs and doesn't offend. The boundaries that we place around things like worship and doctrine or whatever else become the booths we create used to hold back the glory of God from the people outside of our circles. But we're called to be the beloved community, to show the reign of God on earth through our witness, and our God cannot be contained in booths. And this story isn't about the booths, then or now, it's about Jesus. It's about the voice of God that breaks into the sacred mountain where Jesus stood transfigured with the two most important people in Jewish history to tell us to listen to what Jesus has been trying to tell us all along. Really listen. To be more than spectators of grace. Listen so we can embrace and embody the things that we have heard and seen and live like we believe it. To listen to Jesus. Listen when Jesus says that you are loved. Listen when he tells you that your identity is rooted in him and that we are who he says we are. Listen when he tells us that we are better than the worst thing we've ever done and we will be given the grace to do more good than we could ever imagine. Listen to him. Listen to that part about liberation to the oppressed, good news to the poor, sight to the blind, the part about loving your neighbor as yourself, even when you don't like them, especially when you don't like them. And with the disciples, go down that mountain to proclaim the good news of God's astounding love to a world that so desperately needs it, so much so that it can't handle it. And we too are called to be transfigured, to be changed into something more good and beautiful than we are, and of course, this story has nothing to do with being changed into the actual likeness of the radical teacher from Nazareth. It has everything to do with being transformed into radical bearers of the light of God's inclusive love down the mountain into a world in desperate need of that light and love. The story of the transfiguration reminds us that God loves us beyond our wildest imaginations. And that reminder empowers us to go put that love into action into the world. But we should be careful because living a life transformed by grace can be a dangerous thing to do. Jesus went down the mountain and left the light behind. And following Jesus through the transfiguration will mean getting more dirty than it does shining in glory. And it inevitably leads to a cross, but after death, always comes resurrection. The transfiguration is a promise that God is present and God is sovereign even over the worst circumstances that we find ourselves in, especially in the times that we're not so sure that that is true. 
and the memory of that glimpse of glory can sustain us during the times that it's tempting to forget through the season of Lent and through the season of this global pandemic, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is a glimpse of the glory to come and the promise of the unending grace that meets us in the most unexpected of places. Amen. both lamb and shepherd you lord are both prince and slave you peacemaker and sword bringer of the way you took and gave you the everlasting scorn and crave. Clothed in light upon the mountain, stripped of might and on the cross, shining in eternal glory, beggared by a soldier's loss, you the everlasting both gift and cost. You who walk each day beside us, sit in power and at God's side. You who preach a way that's narrow, have a love that reaches wide to the everlasting instant, you who are our pilgrim guide. Worthy is our earthly Jesus, worthy is the cosmic Christ, worthy your defeat and victory, Worthy still your peace and strife, you the everlasting instant, you who are our death and life. Now may the God who said, let light shine out of darkness and is shown in our hearts, give us light to bear to the world that all may see and know that God is love. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen.